I will turn and, and now I'll give the ground to Ferle Miranda, who is Senior Economist of the Employment, Labor and Social Affairs Directorate at the OECD. And she's going to speak about youth transition in times of COVID-19. So Ferle, you have the ground for 15 minutes, please. Yes, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Olofo. This is uh, really a pleasure for me uh, to be part of, uh, of this workshop. And uh, I hope uh, that you will enjoy uh, my presentation. Um, in this slide, um, I show you the evolution of the unemployment rate for young people aged 15 to 24 years old for uh, the OECD on average. And so you can very nicely see that um, the, um, the youth unemployment rate reached 18.1% uh, in May 2020. And it was the highest youth unemployment rate in a decade after an unprecedented increase of 6.8 percentage point in the months March and April. And um, the increase means that the number of unemployed youth in the OECD area went from 8.9 million in January 2020 to uh, 12.8 million in May, uh, just a few months later. And so in this chart, we can nicely see that the progress that had been made to bring down the youth unemployment rate um, since the great financial crisis has just been wiped out in just one quarter. The, there is a striking variation uh, across OECD countries in the increase in unemployment rates. For example, on, at the right hand side of this uh, chart, we see that in the United States and Canada, unemployment among young people rose by nearly 20 percentage point in just a few months. Whereas in the EU 27 countries, youth unemployment rate rose by just 2.2 percentage point. And so these large variations in increase in unemployment rate reflect differences in policy responses, and in particular, the use of job retention schemes. Now, these job retention schemes have played a major role in cautioning the shock in several uh, OECD uh, countries and mainly European countries. These schemes, so these job retention schemes, they allow to preserve the jobs at companies that experience a temporary drop in business activity, while at the same time providing income support to those young people whose hours have been reduced or have been temporarily laid off. Now, these figures only give a partial uh, picture. This is the unemployment rate, right? And we also know that some young people are just not looking uh, for work at the moment and they're counted as inactive. And indeed, uh, inactivity rates among young people rose also by more than 10 percentage points in Canada, Chile, and uh, Colombia. And when we compare the increase in uh, unemployment rates among young people, which is the blue bars, with the increase in unemployment rates among um, uh, older generations, which is the white dots, we notice that in nearly all countries, young people have been hit much harder by the economic crisis than the older generations. Now, why is that the case? While young workers generally hold less secure jobs than older generations and are overrepresented among workers in the hard hit industries such as accommodation and food services. And also we see that temporary contracts regularly uh, hold by young workers have not been renewed while at the same time there has been a decline, a massive decline in new hiring. And now the key question is how much long, how much lasting damage has been done and how long it will persist. And so if evidence from uh, the global financial crisis uh, that hit the world in 2008 and 2009, this evidence demonstrates that economic shock do not only affect the current uh, youth cohort, but also future generations of young people. Now, this chart shows you the evolution of employment rates 
in the OECD on average were three age groups. So the young people aged 15 to 24 are indicated in red. The older workers um, in the uh, blue line and then the black dotted line shows people aged 25 to 40, uh, 54, sorry. And for all groups, we take the year 2007 as a reference point. Now the red line shows you that out of the 100 people that, uh, young people that were employed in 2007, there were only 90 left in 2010. So in other words, one in 10 jobs held by young people were destroyed during the global financial crisis. And so while the uh, employment rates of um, the um, prime age workers uh, hardly declined and quickly recovered, the uh, youth employment rate took uh, 10 years uh, to recover from the economic shock. And so this figure really makes clear that economic shocks tend to have long lasting scaring effects uh, for young people in particular. And um, results from an online survey that was run here by the OECD uh, between uh, 7 and 20 of April in this year, uh, with the participation of 90 youth-led organizations from 48 uh, countries, so not only OECD countries, but also other uh, non-member countries. And so these results from the online survey uh, show that young people express the greatest concerns about mental health but also employment and disposable income. Now in OECD member countries, which is indicated by the blue bars, um, concerns about education and concerns about fam familial and friendship relationships rank uh, equally high. Now, it should be noted that the labor market position of young people in uh, was even weak before we went into, into the current crisis. Over the past decade and a half, young people saw an increase in the probability of underemployment. So they would like to work more, but they couldn't find work, uh, full-time work. Um, the deterioration in labor market position has been particularly pronounced among young people with less than tertiary education. Over the past decade and a half, we saw widespread increases in the incidence of non-employment. So one out of seven young people across the OECD are neither in employment nor in education or training. And we also see low pay among those in employment. And so even among highly educated uh, uh, young people, low paid employment has increased in many OECD countries. And so on average across the OECD, young people who are highly educated are now more likely to be in low paid jobs than to be in high paid jobs. And then finally, we also notice that young uh, job seekers are much less well covered by out of work benefits than older job seekers. Less than 30% of young job seekers receive unemployment benefits. And so they have a much higher risk than older generations to fall uh, into poverty if they don't receive support from their family. And so what, what, what should we be doing now? And what have we learned from the previous crisis? Now, the most important thing is to act quickly and to help young people maintain the links with the labor market and education system, how difficult it may be. Uh, but it's important to try at least uh, to keep these links uh, as much as possible. So first of all, um, Countries have been offering support for companies who provide jobs or work experiences for young people. For example, France introduced a hiring premium specifically targeted to young workers. In Australia and Denmark, we see that they have introduced wage subsidies to help companies maintain or expand their apprenticeships. Also in Germany and Scotland, uh, those employers who take on apprenticeships uh, from other companies that have uh, been made redundant so these companies receive subsidies. And in Canada, we see an ex expansion of its job, summer job program. So also uh, wage subsidies for uh, below 30 year old. And so these are all uh, measures that uh, give uh, companies the uh, opportunity or uh, more support to continue hiring uh, young people. 
Now, for those young people um, who have been laid off or be who became unemployed, um, it's important that they keep on looking for jobs, even if there's very few jobs available. And so public employment services, but also other organizations can provide a really important support in terms of counseling and guidance to encourage young people to use the best time, the, the, the time in the best possible way. And maybe uh, if they can't find immediately work, those young people who have the possibility could try uh, to um, temporarily uh, become engaged in voluntary or community work because this type of work experience can also help um, to, um, to stay motivated, to uh, keep a good network. Uh, um, but of course, it requires that you have the financial resources to do so. Um, now, for, for countries or for, for, for places that are where it's still very difficult to um, organize trainings uh, in, a, in, a, in a physical way, digital channels, like this workshop, for example, are, can be uh, very useful opportunities to provide training so that young people, even if, if they can't go to school, uh, that they um, try to um, keep on learning. Um, and then finally, because we also see that uh, not all sectors um, uh, stopped hiring, there are certain sectors that actually face acute labor shortages. And uh, it is, um, uh, it could be useful for young people to um, um, get uh, work experience in the sector, even though it's not immediately their own um, um, sector. And then finally, um, uh, um, an, 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 another uh, very important um, policy measure is to uh, reach out to those young people who have lost contact, either with their jobs or who have lost school uh, without finding uh, employment. Because vulnerable young people do not necessarily get themselves in contact with government services or youth organizations. Uh, because they don't know that support exists or um, they do not have confidence confidence in the government uh, and so um, by um, organizing outreach uh, strategies in collaboration either with schools or youth organizations through a uh, social media campaign um, these young people uh, can be motivated to um, uh, to, to either um, go back to school if possible, if not try to follow uh, a digital training uh, if possible or otherwise um, uh, um, other, other opportunities. And so um, I think I've used up my time. So in the uh, publications that I showed here at the bottom of the page, uh, you can find more information. Now, of course, uh, um, you can't click, but um, uh, on the OECD website, there's tons of information on all of the topics uh, that I've mentioned today. And if you want to uh, contact me, my email address is mentioned there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, very fairly. If you want to, maybe you can send some of these documents links through the chat for everyone. I think they oh, would yes, appreciate. Sir. Thank you very much yes, for sir. insightful, insightful thoughts with us for sharing with us right now. So I would like to, to give the floor to Dr. Heidi Ullman, who is Social Affairs Officer of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. She's talking about youth transitions in Latin America, the role of families. Please, Heidi, you have now 15 minutes. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Before I begin my presentation, I just wanted to extend uh, thanks uh, to the organizers of the event for inviting me to participate and to share the Latin American perspective on these issues. And I think also, um, when thinking about youth transitions, we tend to focus the policy strategies on the youth themselves, 
uh, whereas there are often contextual factors that also have an important implication on how the youth uh, are able to make those successful transitions from education to the labor market and so we, sh we, with this work, try to show uh, a shine some light on one of those factors, which is the role of the family. Um, I think one important point is that in Latin America, actually quite a bit of progress has been made, at least um, in expanding education opportunities for youth. Um, as we see here, uh, there are two graphs. The one on the left is showing the conclusion of secondary education among youth 20 to 24, and the one uh, on the right is uh, tertiary edu education. And we see that there has been an increase across the board from 2002 to 2006 um, for both secondary and tertiary education. But what this graph also shows very clearly are the very dramatic differences that exist for youth uh, and the opportunities they have depending on their household socioeconomic level. So in this panel here on the left, we see that under four out of every 10 youth from the lowest uh, income quintile, i.e. The, the, the poorest households, finish secondary education compared with over eight of 10. And looking at tertiary education, the gap is even more stark. We see that fewer than four out of every 10 um, youth from the poorest, house, uh, poorest households finish, uh, I'm sorry, under 4% of those in the poorest households finish tertiary education compared uh, with over, just over 40% in the wealthiest households. So a tenfold. Uh, difference. And clearly, uh, this information uh, has an impact on what types of jobs the youth are able to get in the labor market. So this graph shows an improvement in access, generalized, but still with severe gaps for those um, in the poorest households. But also, what does it tell us about, it doesn't tell us really anything about what youth are learning, the quality of that education, and thinking about the highly uh, technology-based uh, technolo technology and digitalized nature of the labor market, um, it leaves us with serious questions of what types of jobs youth can uh, secure uh, once they're at the point when they're ready to enter the labor market. So there have been improvements. Um, but clearly the COVID crisis uh, is, is creating a situation in which we foresee serious setbacks uh, in education. Uh, and as my colleague uh, from OECD mentioned uh, in her presentation in Latin America, we also see a very similar worrying situation in the labor market. Before the pandemic, we knew that uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, as in many other regions, perhaps all youth are at a market disadvantage in the labor market. Um, this is in, in contrast to their higher levels of education than previous cohorts uh, and their more um, act, easier access or more closeness with technologies, youth still have much higher uh, unemployment rates. Uh, when they are in employment, um, it tends to be more precarious without access to social protection, lower wages, uh, unstable, et cetera. So this is already a situation that existed in the, in the context before the COVID pandemic, and it is uh, a situation which will undoubtedly uh, deteriorate in the coming uh, months. Another concern that we have in Latin America, as in other regions, is the situation of youth, uh, young people who are not uh, in employment, education, or training. Uh, our region is perhaps a little different than others in that this situation uh, tends to be much greater among young women than young men. So even though in the region there is so in the social imaginary, the youth that are in this group are young men who are, you know, urban and, you know, hanging out on corners, not doing anything in particular, uh, or even worse, there's a very stigmatized view of youth in this situation. The reality is that most uh, women, most of the people in this group are actually women, and they're in this group uh, due to having to attend to domestic um, and care tasks that are non-paid, um, right? So then there's this issue of how to help these young women reconcile their studies, paid work with their domestic uh, responsibilities. 
And so why do we think it's important to look for families? As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, when we think about youth transition, so when we think about supporting youth in getting the education they need, uh, and the training that they need, and then uh, to have a fluid transition into the labor market, uh, we tend to focus our attention on the subject, on youth, without um, considering possibly that youth are living in families, they're living in communities, and that those contextual factors play an important role uh, in determining what path the youth will take. And these days, and especially now with the COVID pandemic, we should also recognize that the transitions aren't as linear as they once were. It's not the case that you know, necessarily there is a conclusion of education and then a transition into a job that a, a young person will have for a very extended amount of time. Um, these uh, transitions have become more segmented and more diverse and dynamic, and families uh, are one of the reasons that that is so, particularly for young women. So in our region, we thought it was important to look uh, at families for two reasons. One. Uh, young people, uh, many young people still live in their families of origin, and we know that families of origin are important to provide sort of material well-being, emotional well-being, guidance, connections, uh, a whole host of things. And then another consideration for our region is that a high percentage of youth already have families of their own. So um, even though fertility rates have declined very dramatically uh, across the region, women still tend to have children earlier on uh, and to begin their own families. Uh, and we see in this graph, these are uh, youth 15 to 29 years of age who are heads of households or spouses of heads of households. And we see that close to 50% of those 25 to 29 are already heading their own household. Um, and it's also a, a phenomenon that is uh, marked by social uh, inequalities as uh, we see here the poor uh, youth, they also tend to be more uh, heads of households. So they begin uh, their independent family at earlier ages uh, than other youth um, who are uh, wealthier. So I think this also goes back to a point uh, with the education slide that I showed, which is that the youth in the region are also tremendously diverse and heterogeneous. You can't speak of one type of youth transition because uh, of the very, very heterogeneous circumstances in which uh, youth uh, grow and develop uh, in the countries of the region. So for these reasons, we thought it was important to think about how families, both origin families and family, independent families, how policies can support those families to uh, help promote positive transitions between education uh, and the world of work. Of course, the context of the pandemic brings about an entirely uh, new reality for all of us. The pandemic uh, arrives in a region that was already uh, experiencing very, a very complex economic situation, a very complex social and political situation, and the region is very vulnerable to the effects of the pandemic. In fact, today, the region leads the world regions uh, in number of cases. Uh, and so the region has been extremely uh, adversely affected by the pandemic due to structural um, challenges that existed before, such as high levels of inequality, uh, poverty, also weak social protection and health systems. So all of this has created sort of this uh, very worrying situation that has made Latin America and the Caribbean extremely vulnerable to the social and economic impacts of the crisis. So uh, as in the EC, uh, OECD that we just heard, um, the group uh, of the task, youth task force of the UN in Latin America and the Caribbean did an online exercise, um, a consultation to find out the views and experiences of youth in the context of the pandemic. Uh, and I'm showing some of the, the, the concerns and the findings uh, from that exercise. Uh, so we see that just about uh, here, one in six youth say they do not have enough money to buy food. Uh, that's very worrying. And this is uh, much higher for indigenous youth. Um, we know that indigenous communities have been especially affected by both the health and the social and economic impacts of the crisis. One in four youth in the region worries about their financial situation or that of their families. 
One in five worries about their education in terms of being able to continue their education or experiencing delays, or even in some cases, youth expressing that they will have to stop studying so they can enter the labor market to contribute economically to their households. And finally, one in three youth uh, who worked uh, prior to the um, advent of the pandemic in the region, um, they report a deterioration in their work situation. Either uh, they lost their job, their contract was suspended, uh, or their labor hours were reduced. So these are all uh, very worrying um, indicators that we see here. Um, and that, that relate to the family, right? That they relate to the family economic situation, to the family uh, situation of being able to work. Uh, and then uh, other impacts on domestic situations uh, brought on by the pandemic has to do with um, an increase in domestic tasks, domestic and care tasks. Uh, so here we ask youth, um, how did their load of domestic work change with the advent of the pandemic? And we see that a high percentage of them, uh, particularly women and those in the 20 to 24 uh, age group, uh, expressed that their load of domestic tasks has increased. And so both from a financial standpoint, but also uh, in these other dimensions, such as care, uh, we think that uh, focusing policies uh, on families to support youth um, is, will be a, a necessary strategy going forward uh, in, in order to build back better and with more equality, right? So some of the measures uh, that are being taken by some countries of the region include uh, an emergency basic income. This has been implemented by, by some countries. Uh, now thinking about the longer term impacts uh, of the pandemic, it will likely need to be extended or think more broadly in terms of a universal basic income. Also transfers of other kinds and strategies to support uh, food security and nutrition. Another issue which is very important in our region, uh, as we've realized that many of the activities for education and work to continue with those uh, education trajectories and work trajectories, people need to have access to internet and to different devices that many households in Latin America simply lack. Um, and it's not only a problem of access, it's also having the skills to be able to use those tools. So ECLAC has uh, proposed recently the provision of a basic ICT basket that in includes devices, but also um, access to internet free of charge. Um, as my colleague or predecessor mentioned in her presentation, uh, thinking about training and mentoring opportunities that can be done online to ensure that this isn't lost time for youth, that they are able to continue um, their capacity building and their education. Um, and then clearly uh, labor inclusion uh, programs that target youth specifically will be urgently needed uh, in the recovery phase. And also thinking about how we can link different of these um, intervention strategies. So linking basic income with uh, online training training and mentoring with labor inclusion. So trying to create synergies um, and linkages between different kinds of programs. And finally, care programs. Um, a reason even before the pandemic that many young women weren't able to be in the labor market related to this uh, lack of possibility to conciliate or to reconcile their uh, home and work responsibilities or care, uh, education responsibilities. And this is uh, even more aggravated now. So um, with that, I'll close and I think um, the message would be though that when we think about youth transitions, we need to think about youth development in a more integrated way. So the two main pillars might be education and access to decent work, but there are other factors as well, contextual factors, like I've said, but also thinking about the health of young people, the mental health of young people, um, and how they are able to participate as active citizens uh, in this whole process, I think is also very uh, important to look at and take into consideration when we're developing policies. Thank you very much. Uh, I leave you here with my, uh, my email in case you have any questions and also to ECLAC resources uh, in case you have any interest in these. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insights, Heidi. I'm sure this is going to, to be a strong motivation for everyone. Also working on suggestions on the statements that I, I'm sure you're doing right now. So we have some, a few questions uh, and I'll, I'll, 
I'll bring them. So from Jose Ricardo, he asks, taking into account the pandemic is impacting both the youth transition and the families, what could be the short-term recommendations to address the effects of the pandemic in youth transitions also? What could be the role of the family in this atypical situation? Please first, Haiti, and then I will, I will, I will call Verla to compliment. Thank you very much. I mean, I think the pandemic has uh, been extremely stressful for everyone. Youth living with their families not only, you know, have their own worries, some of which we shared, but they also perceive the worry and the stress that their parents uh, may be experiencing in this situation, particularly youth from more vulnerable households. And so I think, like I said, there have to be twin and parallel strategies that are implemented in in coordination, so income, uh, food and nutrition support, uh, but then also giving youth opportunities to continue to, um, to, to build capacities, to uh, learn different skills, that they can then see a sort of an immediate, or not immediate, but in a short term, some transition into uh, something that will be income generating for themselves and for their families. Thank you very much. Ver Ferlet, please. Yes, I, uh, I wanted to add, I mean, I'm, I fully agree what, what, what my colleague Heidi already said. So I just wanted to add that uh, I think, especially for in the current uh, crisis, um, I think social network uh, is very important and can be really helpful. Uh, of course, uh, meeting people in person may be complicated. Um, but there's still telephone uh, there for those who have access to internet. Um, reaching out to people who you think uh, need, uh, um, can, can, even if it's just listening to, to their problems, even if it's just reaching out, like how they're doing. I think this, this type of initiatives um, can be extremely helpful um, because we should not forget this is a very, very complicated time. It's very stressful for everybody. Um, and um, just uh, making sure you reach out to the vulnerable um, can uh, be very beneficial for the mental health uh, of, 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 I mean, not only young people, right? It is to everybody, um, but young people are often more in need of, of, uh, of social contact. They're still growing. Um, it, they're still developing very much. And so, uh, of course, a uh, youth organization, even if, even if there's not enough government support uh, in terms of monetary support or even in job search support, uh, youth organizations can also play uh, a, a very uh, important role to um, keep the network that they have built up going, um, trying to um, bring young people in contact with resources that they may not necessarily be aware of. Um, and so I think it's 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 uh, everybody can contribute to to helping uh, uh, young people through these difficult times. Yes, thank you. Very interesting. Uh, I'll go to a next question from Marcia Garcia, who is from Guatemala. She mentions that education has been strongly affected in order that sixty percent of population does not. Uh, has access to internet in her country and government seem not to be facing the problem. Also from Brazil, we, we have the same situation, though the numbers are different, but there's a, a very important uh, percentage of population who has not internet access, so these children are not having any kind of formal education throughout this year. So they ask, she asks us, what recommendation could you made in those cases? I mean, I th I'm sure that this is like a big deal. So if you have some thoughts on that and can share with us, we would appreciate, please. Heidi, I'll give you the floor. So, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said, I we knew that internet connectivity in many countries in Latin, America and the in Latin America and the Caribbean was already a challenge before this pandemic, and this has just thrown a, a very severe light on that. Um, 
uh, and you know, I think that there are, countries are thinking of more creative ways to try to uh, address this problem. Um, so using radio or TV or sending out materials to students who might not have access to online learning technologies. But the fear there is that it's just going to exacerbate the already very glaring disparities in education. Education in, in Latin America, the quality of the education is very segmented by uh, the student's socioeconomic level or if they live in an urban or a rural place or you know, their racial or ethnic um, conditions. So uh, it's, it's a very big concern that this uh, situation will actually aggravate that gap that already exists. Um, so I think in an urgent way, it, it's necessary to try to just do these measures to try to expand access as quickly as possible to these households and then continue to use these complementary measures of TV and radio and you know, sending materials to places as alternatives, um, but definitely keep the pressure on trying to expand access um, and skills to use uh, the digital technologies. Sure, thank you, thank you. And Fairly, do you have any thoughts on that, considering the OECD situation or any other information you have? Well, I, I think Heidi has already been been very complete, she, and, and also she's the, the expert on, on that in America. So I think I'll, I'll skip this question. I have nothing further to add. Sorry. Thank you very much. So uh, I have a, there's also an interesting question here from Gloria Garzon regarding uh, mental health issues that are emerging right now, besides all these economics. So, she says, during COVID-19, some young people have been affected emotionally due to the lack of social life and also job loss. Some have found jobs at all centers, but his kind of job has made stress, has increased stress. And also they are being affected with uh, longer hours of work. There are some research on this going on. Now, some of these youngsters cannot even respond to college studies because, well, some at some place they are just delaying the, the beginning of, of college studies or they are attending online without the, the social connection that uh, a campus can provide. So consider all these mental health issues. What has, be, what has been suggested to attend this situation or to address it on the short term? And also maybe this has some long-term impact on, on young people, you know, maybe this can be a mark for this generation. We don't know yet what will be the consequence. So do you have any information on this or, well, any thoughts to share with us, please, Heidi? Well, I can, I mean, I can certainly confirm, confirm sorry. Yes. I can certainly sure. confirm that the risk uh, of mental health issue is, is real uh, here um, and it should be really taken seriously. Um, uh, the, the, the anxiety and the stress and, uh, uh, that, that are um, uh, due to the, the result of, of the current uh, situation um, certainly will have uh, a big impact uh, on uh, on on everybody. I mean, not only on young people, but but really even on smaller children can feel the effects of the anxiety and the stress that is going out around on in the household. Um, so uh, I I would certainly suggest that those young people who have the possibility um, to reach out to um, mental health support, uh, a psychologist, psych psychotherapist, um, that they should no, not doubt about um, uh, uh, getting in contact um, with the um, uh, specialized services. Uh, now, of course, uh, I, I'm fully aware that access to mental health services um, is very uh, difficult. Um, the, uh, it's, it's either there's no available or it's too expensive um, or uh, it's, uh, yeah, young people are just not aware of it. So the, um, it, is, it is an area uh, also where the OCD has been working on uh, for, for a long while now, mental health and, and, and the impact uh, on, on work, the relationship with work. Um, and 
uh, it is very important to um, to search a support as soon as possible because mental health problems, even if they're small, if it's just, just a small uh, anxiety problem or depression, can really have very long-term uh, consequences. And uh, we see even for OECD countries that um, the um, the biggest inflow, inflow in uh, disability benefits is related to mental health problems. And when we look at when these mental health problems started, uh, it's often already 10 years later, uh, 10 years earlier, but by the time that people seek support, it's, it can be too late and it can have long uh, and a very important damaging effects on, on, on health, not only on mental health, but also physical health. And um, we also noticed that um, three quarters of mental health problems that turn into disability, they actually started uh, by the age of 15. So um, young people uh, are particularly vulnerable for developing long lasting um, mental health problems that can have severe uh, consequences. So um, at the OECD we have uh, actually been working with, with an, an, a range of countries to um, make sure they provide better services to young people, even already in schools to, uh, of course now it's a different situation, schools are closed in many countries, um, but access to mental health services is, is very important. Now, of course, in, in the current situation, uh, it's further complicated by uh, the, um, uh, lack, lack, the, the physical access uh, to services. Um, so where possible, um, psychologists and other mental health services have been offering um, online services, telephone services, um, and uh, this can be uh, certainly very helpful. And, um, it's maybe there's also again a role for um, youth associations, families to encourage young people to talk about these issues and not um, not keep the problems to themselves. Thank you, Fairley. Heidi, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I agree completely uh, with what Fairley has said. I would just add a one point that before the pandemic there's so much stigma around mental health issues and mental health is really sort of an invisibilized portion of health. You know, when we think of health, it's only very recently in the past decades that anyone has even mentioned uh, mental health and there's so much stigma around it that I think maybe the pandemic can serve it as an opportunity to highlight the importance uh, of mental health um, as part of this integral uh, conception of health. Um, so I, I think that um, this idea of trying to expand services and raise awareness of mental health issues and to seek treatment um, as, as soon as possible uh, definitely is, is very, uh, very important. Okay, thank you very much. Just to add one point that here in Brazil, September is a month dedicated to raise awareness on mental health issues. So there are campaigns on it. And I think this is going to be strengthened this year due to this uh, consequence of this COVID pandemic. Now we have just four minutes left and one, one, one question, one more question. I'll first address to, to Heidi and then I'll give the floor to, to Philip. So taking into account policies to reconcile work and family can be positive for society. Oh, sorry. Reconcile work and family can be positive for society. What are the major benefits of this policy in the long term? And maybe consider the topic we are, we are talking now uh, for the youth beginning their uh, professional career, career. So please, Heidi. Uh, so I think that there are long-term, um, so expanding uh, care uh, systems and supporting families uh, as they transition from a couple to having a first child, which is particularly critical in those first five years, especially because in those first five years, if you think about it, that young couple is still trying to establish themselves professionally while caring for this child in which time the care is, is most acute. I mean, as anyone who has ever cared for an under five child, it's very time consuming, it's very tiring, it's very rewarding, but it does devote a lot of energy that you clearly can't be devoting to other things and time. Um, so in this sense, 
care policies can support these young people by allowing them to perhaps make better choices or, or the choices that they want to make about their careers. But at the same time, it has a very, so that would have a positive impact on them and their trajectories. But it would also have a very positive impact on the children. So care in the first years of life, um, especially when it's integrated sort of care, education, nutrition, at least in the Latin American context, these integrated uh, care um, policies have had very positive impacts um, in the development in the long course for those children who experimented. So in that sense, um, it can bring uh, sort of gains everywhere, I would say. Um, so that would be, uh, and there have been very positive experiences. There have been some experiences, some um, uh, good practices in Latin America uh, that have um, that have been replicated in other countries of the region um, that precisely seek to do this to support young families with young children with this sort of dual objective uh, in mind. Thank you, Heidi and Fairly. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I, I just um, would like to add that. I think one of the main um, benefits uh, of, uh, of policies to con reconcile work and life is certainly also for, for on the uh, female side, on women, by uh, having these policies in place, you can allow more women to, uh, to join the labor market, to look for a job, um, and uh, combine that with uh, having children. Um, it also, uh, we know that uh, it's also what Heidi mentioned, like the, the first child is often uh, the, the uh, um, important uh, change. And we see that if we look at unpaid work, um, among young people um, in most countries, or in, 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 in most OECD countries, I would say, um, young people uh, have do an, an, an equal amount of unpaid work, uh, house, uh, home shares and, and, and so. Um, until the first, even in a couple, even in a married couple, until the first child arrives. And then we see that women take on uh, the burden of, of, uh, of unpaid work uh, at home. And so by allowing um, women to, um, to combine work uh, and uh, family life, um, we see that, that um, more and more, um, the, the, the unpaid work is, becomes more equally uh, never, never fully equally, but uh, we see that men uh, tend to take up a bigger, bigger part of that work. So, I would say that policies to reconcile work and life, um, a big benefit is a, a higher uh, female labor market participation and more gender equality in the long run. So, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for insights, for sharing with uh, us. your knowledge. I'm sure that this has enriched a lot. The, the knowledge of everyone and also, I mean, all, even bringing some new lights on these issues. So thank you very much for joining us here today uh, in the name of all the participants and also of the IFFD.